Great pleasure to introduce your speaker, Tom Faza, professional engineer, home inspector, ASHI member, NAHI member, and writer. Tom presents home show seminars for the general public and provides technical workshops at national conventions for home inspectors. He also gives presentations to builders, remodelers, attorneys, and others with home-related interests. Tom is a recovering registered professional engineer with more than 40 years of construction and engineering management experience. He's known as Mr. Fix-It to loyal readers, callers to his radio, weekly radio show, viewers for his TV appearances, and audiences at home shows and conventions. His Saturday morning radio call-in show on AM620 WTMJ out of Milwaukee draws more than 45,000 listeners each hour. During the week, Tom is a home inspector with more than 20 years and 8,000 inspectors under his belt. Tom has published books on home repair and operation, such as How to Operate Your Home, The Home Journal, Home Systems Guide, Basic Home Systems, Home Systems Illustrated, My Home, My Home, My Casa, and Just Fix It. Tom also provides illustrations, newsletters, email marketing materials, and articles for home inspector marketing. He has customers in every state in Canada. So with that, please help me welcome Tom. Well, I, thanks, guys. I am thrilled to be here today, and I want to thank Ashley for inviting me to make this presentation today on moisture intrusion in the buildings. Um, it's always great to see a good group of Ashy inspectors who uh, want to learn things and do things better. Uh, but you can't hear? Can you hear me? Maybe the sound needs to be turned up a little bit. Yeah, how about that? Can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me now? All right. Okay, can you hear me now? All right. Anyway, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm glad that Ashy invited me, and uh, I've been working with Ashy for a long time. And I think it's a great operation and a great group, and they do a wonderful job. So I'm here to talk about moisture intrusion in the buildings. But before I start, I always like to know a little bit about my audience. So just give me a little idea with a raise of hands. Who's been doing inspections for five years or more? Five years or more. So a whole bunch of people. How about 10 years or more? I'm in that group. How about 20 years or more? Oh, we got a bunch of those guys, too. Well, here's what we're going to do. If I need some help and I get stuck... <laughs> Step up to the microphone and tell me what you really think. Because I know inspectors don't mind telling people what they really think. So I do appreciate the input and I do appreciate questions, but make sure you use the microphone. The other thing I wanted to know is if there's any um, trades people in the group, background in trades, in the building trades. Okay. How about background in um, engineering? Any engineers in the group? A couple of those? Okay. How about any architects? couple architects. Okay. So for the engineers, I'm going to speak very slowly <laughs> and use small words. <laughs> and when we're all done, the architects will explain the presentation to you. <laughs> I do like to say I'm a recovering engineer. It means I went to school and took a bunch of classes and passed all the tests and I'm still working on recovering from that. Um, beautiful log home, ain't that something? This is, it looks like a real log home, but it's actually a, a pretty typical platform frame, two by six construction with a half log veneer on the outside. So that's actually a half log home, but that's beautiful. That's uh, uh, in the Milwaukee, Wisconsin area. It's owned by a guy who owns a funeral home. There must be money in funeral homes, I guess. And, uh, we're going to come back to that later, and we're going to wonder about what did the home inspector see? And if you look at the back porches and look at the header across the top of the garage door, maybe something's going on. But we'll come back to that, and that's a water intrusion issue, moisture intrusion issue. Ooh, there's that header a little closer. Um, they actually discovered the problem because the window above here had a bunch of horror... 45 degree cracks in the drywall because everything is dropping down. But we'll come back to this one. So, in order to be a great inspector, you need to think about hidden problems, in my opinion. 
And in order to stay out of trouble, you need to think about hidden problems. Because uh, unfortunately, our customers think we know everything and we see everything. And we kind of tell them that in our marketing. You want the best, hire me. And sometimes you only get a little clue to a problem. You don't really see the problem. You know, those big cracks in the basement walls, those are easy. But it's those small ones and a little bit of movement. Or a uh, water stain around a window, you know, how bad is it? Or a little rotted trim. What's bad and what's good and what's just a typical kind of thing? And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about knowing how water flows, recognizing the signs of problems, know about construction details that can cause problems. We'll touch on mold just a little bit because water causes mold problems. I'm not big on mold stuff, but I'm big on water intrusion. That obviously is one of the elements you need to cause mold. Um, and I think as home inspectors, we should warn our customers about problems and potential problems that you see. Little basics about water. Gravity pulls water down. It wants to fall out of the sky. Cohesion means water is sticky. It wants to stick together. The molecules want to stick together. And adhesion means water wants to stick to other things. So if you think about it, when you're taking a shower, you'll have molecules of water, bubbles of water, water beating up on the shower walls. It's sticking to, to itself, making a droplet, sticking to the wall. And if you think about the old high school experiments in physics, you ever do that one where you have a glass of water and you fill it and you fill it and fill it, and then the, the water is uh, uh, above the edge of the glass of water. It's, it's a cone. It's above the edge of the glass of water. And that's because of adhesion. Water wants to stick to itself, and so it creates this, um, I don't want to call it meniscus, but it's this area top uh, above a glass of water. And then it has surface tension. So adhesion, cohesion, and it wants to stick together. It wants to form droplets. And then the combination of those has to do with capillary action, too. So how does capillary action work? It climbs up. Small openings, not big openings, small openings. You know, here in California, the redwood trees, some of the big redwoods are at 300 feet tall, something like that. How does the water get up there 300 feet? Water's evaporating from the leaves. It's sucking that water out of the leaves a little bit through evaporation. And capillary action is drawing that water up real fine tubes of that tree all the way to the top. How do you break that down, if you think about it? This adhesion property and this cohesion property. Well, that old high school experiment where maybe you would lay a, like a toothpick on top of a glass of water would lay on top. And you put a few drops of detergent in, the detergent breaks down the surface tension. It breaks down the adhesion and cohesion, and it sinks to the bottom, or at least sinks to the top. Or you'll have a glass with this water that's raised up over the top, and you put a few drops of water in, and it drops down and runs over the side, because the detergent breaks down the surface tension. It's the same thing you do if you think about washing clothes. When you wash clothes, you're adding detergent. Detergent breaks down the adhesive property, the cohesive property. It lets the water molecules break down, surround the dirt, and bring it to the surface. Why do we soften water? Because soft water has less of an adhesion cohesion. When you're trying to soap up with hard water, you don't soap up as well. But you add a little bit of detergent, or you soften the water, and it works a whole lot better. So detergent breaks down surface tension. This is just a little representation of capillary action. Capillary action, water will climb higher in a small tube. So the small tube's on the right, big one on the left. What's the limit to capillary action? How much of a gap do you need to totally stop capillary action? Yeah, about three-eighths of an inch. About three, three, a quarter of an inch, it pretty much stops. Three-eighths of an inch, it totally stops. Water sticks to surfaces, and that's why we like to see overhangs, and that's why we like to see drip edge flashes. So typically at the edge of a roof, you'll have a gutter and or a drip edge flashing or a flashing running into a gutter. And what this little lip right here does, that little pointed area, it breaks down uh, that surface tension, allows it to drip off the edge, and that's why it's called the drip edge. When you don't have the drip edge, the water wants to stick, it flows down the surfaces, 
and potentially causes all kinds of problems. So how does water flow in the building? Capillary action. It can be drawn up through surfaces like concrete, block walls, openings around windows. Wind forces water in the buildings. So some guys probably work in coastal areas, some ladies in coastal areas. The wind makes a big difference. It'll drive water into gaps and crevices and into buildings. Negative building pressure has an effect. I like to say uh, buildings suck, and they'll suck water in the openings and cracks, and uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later. And then gravity makes bulk water flow into any opening. Um, roofs, flashing, windows, doors, uh, any roof or siding, or potential sources of water. Water also flows with the air. Um, if you sat in the presentation this morning about air control in buildings or flow of air in buildings, he talked about it in a very good way. But air contains invisible water vapor. And who knows what the dew point is? It's a temperature, right? Dew point is a temperature. That's all you have to remember. And the dew point is the temperature at which air becomes saturated and it rains or water condenses on a cool surface. And the way I like to describe that is any time you see moisture on a surface, condensing on a surface, all you have to remember or say is the temperature of the surface must be below the dew point temperature. And you start from there. The temperature of the surface must be the dew, below the dew point temperature. Now, I've been talking about this for years, and it's taken a long time for my head to suck this all in. So I practiced on my wife. And I said, honey, here's all you need to remember. So this is what you all need to remember. Anytime you see moisture condensing on the surface, as a home inspector, all you have to say is, the surface must be below the dew point temperature. So I'm talking to my wife over and over, month after month, and we go out to a party and She's drinking her Manhattan. In Milwaukee, we drink Manhattans, brandy Manhattans, and a nice hot summer day, and the water's running off the outside of the glass, the icy glass. And we're the group, and I said, honey, what's going on there? How come you got that water on the outside of your glass? She says, well, the temperature of the glass must be below the dew point temperature. <laughs> there were no home inspectors in the group. And everybody laughed and couldn't believe what she was saying, but the temperature of the surface must be below dew point temperature. Think about that with condensation on your windows. So it might be in Florida, and you're getting condensation on the outside because you got the air conditioner on in your car. So why are you getting the condensation on the outside? The temperature of the glass must be below the dew point temperature. Up where I live in, northern, in Wisconsin, northern climate, you get a whole bunch of condensation inside as you're breathing because the glass is cold. And why are you getting condensation? Because the temperature of the glass is below the dew point temperature. All you need to remember. Water moves with air, and that's a very important part of what we all need to understand. And I'm sure you've heard of this before. But this is just an experiment done by different people over years. And in the upper area, there's a four by eight sheet of drywall. Drywall, that is. Inside 70%, excuse me, 70 degrees, 40% relative humidity, pretty typical indoor conditions. No vapor barrier, no plastic, just drywall. So the water diffuses through because there's no vapor barrier. How much water diffuses through in a year? In a year, one third quart. Tiny little bit. Take that same piece of drywall and cut a one by one inch hole. So one by one is whole, same condition, 70 degrees, 40% relative humidity. In one year's time, because of air leaks, 30 quarts of water goes through that hole. 30 quarts of water. So remember two things. Whenever you see moisture on a surface, oh, that must be below the dew point temperature, and there must be an air leak carrying all that moisture in here. Those are two things to remember. Drafty old buildings leak lots of air. And the air leaks exchanges remove the moisture from the air. And, and I grew up in a house like that. Um, it was great fun when middle of winter in, in the Midwest and you'd rub your feet in the floor and you'd get all charged up and you 
hit your sister on the ear, you know, zap. I think most of us who had an opportunity to do that did that. That's because the houses were so dry. And where were the, why were the houses so dry? Because they were leaky. Cold winter air came in. Some kind of air went out, warm, moist air, and they dried out the houses through air exchanges. So air and heat leaks dry structures. The other thing with old houses is they had nice wide overhangs. They kept the water away from the windows and doors. And the other thing that happened is old buildings were placed in the best locations, you know, high on the hill. Those 1920s houses and 1900 houses, they're not put in the low areas, they're put in the high areas, and they're built up out of the ground. And they stay dry. So wind pushes air through a house, and old homes leak, and they dry them out. So this is just a typical representation. Wind blows on one side, creates positive pressure. The air flows across the top of the house like an airplane wing, creates a negative pressure on the other side, and the wind just moves right through the house. Now, in the old houses who are drafty and leaky, they're not good good on energy because you got all these leaks, but they never had mold problems and they never had moisture problems because it was like blowing a hairdryer through them all the time. They were always warm and the air was always moving through, and they never had condensation problems. This is kind of an interesting concept to remember, too. So I'm taking typical outdoor air, adding heat. So I'm taking 30 degree outside winter air, adding heat to 70 degrees, and making a typical indoor air at 70 degrees. Okay. This typical outdoor air in the wintertime, 80% relative humidity. That's pretty high humidity. You heat it up, keep the same amount of moisture, that air is now 20% relative humidity. And that's just the science of it, that psychometric chart. What happens is when you warm air up, it holds a lot more moisture. When you cool air down, it can't hold as much moisture. And if you think about it, Every time it rains, what happens? A cold front moves in, right? And the cold front moves through, cools the air, and the water falls out of the air. So what does it cool the air to? Hmm, must be a temperature below the dew point temperature, right? And the weather guys love to talk about dew point temperatures, and I don't think anybody understands. Who understands when the weather guy talks about dew point temperatures? I mean, yeah, I, I don't, still don't understand it. I've been working on this stuff for years. Um, but just remember, dew point is a temperature, and below that temperature, the moisture condenses. Or in the case of air, when you cool the air down, it holds less moisture, and it rains. So we took that outside air, We warmed it up a little bit, went from 80% relative humidity to 20% relative humidity. The dew point's still the same. 25 degrees, 25 degrees. So, now we build these new tight construction houses, and now we've got a whole list of new problems. And if you think about, if you do mold work, or you do remediation work, or you do moisture problem work, It never occurs in those 1920s and 30s houses, unless someone added a bunch of insulation and changed the furnace and changed the windows and did all those things, then they might have some moisture problems. Now, the newer construction homes don't leak air, they don't dry out, they have vapor retarders, wind barriers, efficient direct heating, meaning 90% efficient heating, Um, better windows, they're tight. Now, why would an inefficient 90% furnace make a difference? You ever think about it? 90% furnaces, you're familiar with that. They have an air intake for combustion air, and then they have a, a plastic pipe to discharge combustion products, right? It's a closed system. They don't remove any air from your house. What are the old 60% furnaces, forced air furnaces? They've got this connection to a chimney. They've got a draft diverter. And the chimney might be a 9 by 9 or a 12 by 12 tile, whatever it is, all the way up. So lots of air flow up the chimney 24-7. The draft diverter, a lot of air flow up the chimney 24-7. When the furnace kicks on, the draft diverter sucks even more air out of the house up the chimney. So what is the old furnace doing? Ventilating the house. And I've been on a lot of jobs where 
Well, people call me up and say, oh, I got all this window condensation problem. And I say, what, did you get a new furnace? Yeah, I just got a new furnace. How did you know? Big difference. Big difference in airflow. 90% furnace, good old 60% furnace naturally drafted up a chimney. New houses trap air and water because of all the wraps and the caulking and the air barriers and the vapor barriers. And new homes can have a negative pressure problem. Because they're so tight, then you run the fireplace, a, a wood-burning fireplace. Wood-burning fireplace exhausts how much air? About 300 CFM. Where does 300 CFM come from? It gets sucked in the house wherever there's an opening. Have you ever been on a job where someone's complaining about a sooty smell in my house and uh, it only occurs when I run the clothes dryer? That's my house, my old house, my old tight house. A masonry chimney, just a standard masonry chimney fireplace, I should say, and a clothes dryer on the same level. When you ran the clothes dryer, I had wrapped this house up so tight, it would suck air down the chimney because there was no air supply. And so how do you solve the problem? Open a window. So the clothes, dry clothes dryers exhaust about 300 CFM, and it was enough to uh, backdrap the water heater and then suck air down the masonry chimney. So, the other issue with newer houses is they're stuck in holes in the ground that tend to fill up with water because that's the only land available. So we don't build them like we used to. They're tighter, more comfortable, but they're susceptible water, rot, and moisture damage. Um, the other thing to have with old construction is um, it's resistant to mold and rot. If you think about it, old houses were plaster. Will plaster get moldy? Normally not. Solid wood materials. Solid wood materials resist moisture. No vapor barriers, so the air just flowed right through those puppies and dried them out. And then limited insulation, it's another reason for air to just flow right through wherever it wanted to and dry them right out. So the newer houses have drywall, and drywall is covered with paper. The drywall itself is not a cellulose product, but the paper is. And if you're going to see mold and mildew on drywall, it's going to be on the paper because it's a good food. Newer houses have oriented strand board, OSB. I like to call it was wood. <laughs> yeah, one, once upon a time, that was wood. Um, what wo was wood is susceptible to moisture problems. The glue, um, the materials they use to make it, it's not like solid wood. It will rot quicker and deteriorate quicker. We also have manufactured joists and manufactured beams. A lot of the new eye joists have was wood spacers between the top and bottom plates, and we use a bunch of cellulose. And it's used in all kinds of the synthetic wood products and wood products. And what is cellulose? It's partially digested wood. It's a great food product. What is paper? It's digested wood. Digested meaning it's ready to turn into mold. Really, if you think about it, I mean, it's wood. it was wood, and now it's been processed and partially digested and turned into paper or a cellulose product just ready to mold. And then we use vapor barriers and air barriers, and we trap air, and we trap moisture. So common problems that home inspectors are going to note in a report would be flashing problems, chimney problems, attic ventilation, attic ventil bath ventilation, Siding and flashing issues, basement grading, gutters, and I like to say flashings, 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 and flashings. The three major problems with houses are water, water, and water, and flashing, flashing, and flashing. The six major problems with houses. Okay, what's good water management to keep that water away? So we've got a roof that sheds the water to the sides. We've got a drip edge that keeps the water from sticking. We've got flashings at the top of windows. We've got flashings at the bottoms of windows. We've got a basement, in this case, surrounded by granular fill that drains water. We've got a drain tile system to collect water. In this case, we've got an outside tile, inside tile, bleeder between the two. This house would have a sump pump system in the basement to pump any errant water out. Good grading to keep the water away, a nice gutter system. And I always talk about grading gutters and downspouts. Grading gutters and downspouts. Water management issues. 
poor surface drainage, wet areas, no drain tile system, backfill with clay, downspouts not extended, gutters overflowing, all problems you identify in your home inspection reports. The other thing to remember is all sidings leak. All brick leaks, all wood leaks, vinyl, aluminum, hardboard leaks. So the structure needs to be protected by overhangs, building paper, house wrap, flashings and all penetrations, and all surfaces drained to the outside. Overhangs are important. We've looked at this a little bit before. When I see serious water damage with windows, siding, and inside of homes, it's often because there's no overhang. An overhang makes all the difference. The overhang keeps that water away. And that, it, that water... wants to stick to the surfaces and run down and get into every crack and crevice. So I'm always looking at overhangs. Decks can cause all kinds of problems. This happens to be one where there's uh, done correctly. There's the deck ledger. I don't show the bolts, but this is the right way to do it. Flashing on the back side, lapped over the flashing on the bottom side. House wrap or tar paper over the top of a flashing over the top. How many decks do you see flash like that? Yeah, yeah, none. Okay, that's a good answer. A few, and quite honestly, we can't see a lot of that stuff either. A lot of that's just not visible, but that's the way it should be done. Um, cantilever decks are a disaster. I don't know if I've ever seen a cantilever deck that works. And by cantilever, I mean the 2x8, the 2x12 two by two by two by are sticking out over the side, and there's no post underneath. So the, the bearing... The support structure goes in and from the outside. You cannot flash that properly. I've been on a couple of houses where I was employed as a consultant to solve the problem. And even, even with my supervision <laughs> and a really good contractor, that puppy still leaked. It's almost impossible to keep the water to the outside. Now, some of you folks are from California. And last year, 2015, in Berkeley, I think that balcony fell off the side of the house. An apartment building? Yeah. Um, it made national news because nine, nine college kids were killed, and there were like 12 people on a balcony. It was the fourth story, and it was a cantilever deck, just like this. The building was built in 2007. In 2015, there were 12 or 13 kids on that deck, 12, I think, and it just fell right off the side of the apartment building. The building had, I think, 112 balconies constructed just like that. And the engineers investigating were saying, well, the, the, everything's rotted out. This was totally rotted out right here. And they were basically saying it's a water intrusion problem, and no one could predict it or see it. Well, flashing may have solved the problem. It's, it's really hard to flash. But isn't that something? They built it in 2007. It fell down in 2015. And nine kids were killed, 12 were injured, fourth story. Can you imagine being on a balcony like that? The engineers, in looking at it, said, if you put 15 football players and had them all jump, it should have held that load. And these were part kids having a good party. But it's all from moisture intrusion. Tom, that was also a membrane deck. Was it a membrane deck? OK. So it was a membrane deck and a closed office. So there was nothing visible. You couldn't see any flashing. There was nothing you could look at, right? Did you do the inspection on that building? <laughs> Some of the litigation, OK. I, I always laugh. Like, there's a guy in Milwaukee, Dave Cole. Sorry, he's a great guy. I saw him at one of our local chapter meetings. He said, Tom, I just inspected that house, the one that just burnt to the ground. I looked at it last week. No one's called me yet. <laughs> and I, of course, you know what I did? I just stepped away from him. I went to talk to him. I'm like, I don't want to talk to you. So I'm pretty accurate on my details on that balcony, right? I mean, it's a total disaster, total disaster. But the deal was it wasn't flashed properly to keep the water away. The contractors couldn't. I, I've kind of come to the decision that nobody knows nothing. Nobody knows nothing, in particular deal with contractors. They just don't get it sometimes. A lot of holes, 
a lot of really smart people, but sometimes they just don't put it all together. Okay, a panel flashings, we should have some kind of a Z flashing, I call them. We should have a piece of house wrap over the top of this piece, and then the water eject to the outside. How many times do you see that missing on a building? All the time. Yeah, I looked at a couple of houses, 30 years old. It's T111 paneling. I mean, junk stuff to begin with. But there's no fix. The fix is tear it all off and hope it's not too rotted underneath. They just did a bunch of butt joints and they caulked them. And in some cases, they did a bunch of butt joints and put a 2x4 over the top, or 2x6. 1x6, I should say. 1x6, and then they caulk on the top of the 1x6. You know, there's no fix to it. You tear it all apart and see what's going on. Um, similar situation here. You always should have a flashing over the top of the. Here's the one by six trim, and here's some kind of a, a sheet type siding. And this is a common way it's done, right? How many people have seen this kind of work done? Yeah, right. I mean, I call that out as an issue. It may or may not be rotted when I'm there. If it is rotted when I'm there, I'm telling you, it needs some further investigation. Um, Right before they sell the house, they paint that all off, right? They caulk it and paint it up. Um, the other cute thing I like to see is when the painters come in, they'll caulk right here, too. They caulk that joint, right? And that should not be caulked. They always caulk. Oh, that looks better with caulk on that joint. You know, it's meant to drain the water out. There should be no caulk here. Anyway, I see this detail all the time. And sometimes it works fine. But you know when it works fine? is when there's a two-foot overhang, and it's a single-story house, and it's on a side of the house that doesn't have wind-driven rain. Wind-driven rain, no overhangs, fails. That's just a sketch of the same thing. There should be that flashing in there. Then this is the other thing I see. Here's the caulk detail. Isn't that wonderful? Looks really good, but it's the wrong thing to do. I mean, I don't, do you call that out on reports? I have a standard statement. I call that out. There should be no caulk there. Um, or you'll see a little flashing like this that tipped upwards, and it's just holding the water and things are all rotted out. You know, those are things we should be reporting. And the biggest reason is we don't know what's behind that. I have a, a friend in Milwaukee that does some inspection work with me, and uh, he's a smart guy, relatively new inspector, smart guy. And he had... Some issues like, mm, like this piece of trim, but there was a deck built. There was a deck built here, and that piece of trim had a little bit of rot on it. And, you know, there's a little bit of rot in your trim. That's what he said in the inspection report, and I think that's what most everybody would say. Well, of course, the people moved in, and then there was some water got into the basement area, and then... He got called back to the job, and he's looking at it. Well, there's still a little bit of rot, but maybe the door above here isn't quite perfect. And he calls the seller up, and the seller wasn't real smart. Starts telling him everything uh, to the inspector. He says, well, you know, I had a leak there, and I caulked all the doors and windows up and painted everything up to make it look really nice and sold the house. And, yeah, it leaked into the basement area a little bit, but I was, once I caulked it off, it solved the problem. Well... These poor people, they got an $18,000 problem now. So you start pulling the trim off, and there's all this rot that get into the framing of the house. It was all really not visible because of the deck and things. All you could see was a little rot. So be careful with those things. Um, this gentleman in Milwaukee, I think, did an accurate job reporting it. Um, it got turned over to his e and company. His E&O company denied the claim based on the information available, meaning that the inspector said, you got some rot on some trim. Um, and the previous owner said, I painted it and caulked it, made it look pretty, but it did, I did have some leaks in the basement, and I painted that all up too. Uh, but the people who bought the house are out about 18000 bucks. So I don't know who they're going to go after. That's in process right now. We've got to be careful with those kind of things. And the other thing that happens is basement leaks. I always talk about grading gutters and downspouts, drain tile systems, sump pumps, and siding issues can cause basement problems. If you looked at the ashy journal that came out, maybe this issue, issue before, there was some an article by me about a basement leak caused by a siding problem. And we'll get into that a little bit later. 
Um, I always like to say a basement's a hole in the ground that wants to fill up with water. In the Milwaukee area where I'm from, we have about 1.4 million people, I think include all the suburbs, so pretty small. There are 47 basement repair contractors in the yellow pages. 47. Clay soils, poor maintenance, poor maintenance of grading gutters and downspouts. And block basements. We have a whole lot of block basements. Very few poured basements. Some people are relating to that. Your neck of the woods, too. This is our typical basement in the Milwaukee area. Um, I know this is not common everywhere, but we'll have an outside drain towel. We'll have an inside drain towel. In this case, they're drawn as plastic, which is from the 1970s on. There's a bleeder through the middle, uh, through the bottom of the foundation. Footing, I should say, every eight feet. And so any water that gets next to the foundation is supposed to flow down, it's supposed to be covered in gravel. Um, one tile through the bleeder, interior tile, or some pump and pump out. So we take the water to the inside and pump it out. I know that's not true all over. Some people, if you can drain it to daylight, that's a whole lot better. But we bring all that water inside, drain it to the outside. Pretty common problem. We'll see some pictures of this. Basement leaks, moisture problems, block basement. Whenever you see a stay, uh, stain high on the wall, typically it's what? It's a surface water problem. Grading gutters and downspouts. Typically, surface water problems. In my neck of the woods, when you see a problem down here, and you got a stain all along the lower block, that's almost always a drain tile problem. The drain tile is not taking the water away. There's some imperfection there. It's hampered in some way. The water backs up. Capillary action pulls it up into that first block, and you'll see this very uniform stain. It might be salty. It might be dark, but it's capillary action in a failed drain tile system. You ever see that in the house? Stain all along the base, that's a big issue. Could have been fixed, though. You don't know that, because if it's totally dry... I did an inspection for a house that had some of those symptoms, and then the basement was, most of it was finished, and it was a German guy, and I'm, I'm not a little German in my blood, but a good old German guy who still had an accent who was a really ornery cuss selling the house. So when I dragged him down the basement, 25-year-old house, I said, well, there's these stains at the base, and you know, not, most of this is finished, but obviously you had, oh, yes. I had, in his German accent, the, the builder had a problem, the complete drain tile system was replaced, and a complete sump pump drain tile system was put in. Completely replaced. Great. So what does Mr. Fix at Home Inspector guy? I write that all down on my report, you know. The guy who owns the house said complete replacement. And that helped me a lot when I was in court two years later. <laughs> The homeowner was not suing me, but he was suing the German guy. And the German guy was sitting in the front row, and I'm up on the stand, and he was steaming. He was, and they pull out my report, and right here, you noted that the owner of the house told you that a complete drain tile system had been replaced when the house was built. Yep, that's what he told me. I wrote it down. Well, it wasn't true. He had a minor repair done, and it, it was a huge basic repair problem. But those kind of, I always ask sellers, if I can, what, do you, what caused this? What's going on here? What's the issue? And I always write that down. Broken sewer laterals, in this case, uh, storm sewer can often cause moisture intrusion into the basement. You've probably seen that before. If you haven't, think about it. When you see a wet spot in the basement wall, and there's a downspout that goes underground here, and that's wrong, right? That should be storm sewer. Um, right? Storm sewer. Yeah, well, th let me tell you. This is a 19 1880 house with combined sewers, okay? So um, that can often cause a stain there. Um, and then mechanical system problems. Houses can suck. We talked about that a little bit. You certainly can have backdrafting issues, and that can cause moisture problems in houses and serious health issues. And humidification systems, I love them. Where I'm in a northern climate, April air comes out of Madison, Wisconsin. April air, hum whole house humidifiers. And uh, they don't like me much on my radio show because sometimes I just tell you, you don't need a humidifier. Turn that thing off. 
Um, and then they got really mad at me. I do a radio show. Actually, I have 45,000 people every Saturday morning, and I just kept telling everybody, just turn them off. You don't need them. You don't need them. So finally, you know, they had their attorney call me up. And, I, and in Wisconsin, we call them April Airs. We don't call them whole house humidifiers. We use the brand name. And because they make them right here in Wisconsin, right in Wisconsin. So I got accused of using their brand name and criticizing their company. And, and, you know, we had a really nice back and forth for a while. And then it became an advertiser on my radio show. <laughs> it's like, hey, life is good, yeah? I had nothing against April Air. They made really good, high-quality products. People don't know how to maintain them. They don't know how to use them. They don't know how to set them. The best advice is just turn the damn thing off. <laughs> Still the best advice. The way I tell people to operate humidification equipment in the house is if you're getting consistent condensation on windows, the humidity level is too high. And then people drag out these little temperature, pressure, humidity gauges, you know, built into a clock, and they're looking at this thing, oh, oh, this is the humidity. Uh, no, you know, you can't measure humidity with that. You know those things are? That's a twisted piece of horse hair. And when the horse hair accepts moisture, it moves a little bit and changes the dial. It's really hard to measure relative humidity. It's, it can be done with good equipment, but it's hard to do. Um, so let's look at some problem houses. We're going to look at some roof and siding issues, that log home again, humidification, imbalanced airflow, stone veneer, and uh, siding installation problems. So there's that log house. Oh, boy, that's a pretty one. Uh, I would guess this is a million-dollar house. It's set up in what we call Kettle Moraine area, so a bunch of rolling hills. It's just gorgeous. And again, it's half-log construction. So it's a two-by-six framed house, standard construction with half-logs on the outside of siding. And I got called in not as a home inspector. Home inspector was long gone. Um, I got called in as a consultant to figure out what was going on, what their problem was. Um, so it's a half log siding, two by six frame, it had rigid foam on the outside with house wraps, and it had all kinds of problems. So after I got involved in this house and saw the damage that was done, I made one major decision. I will never inspect a log house again. <laughs> Truly. I, 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 there's one guy in Wisconsin that does log houses and half log houses, and I give him his, if I find out if it's a log house, I will not look at it because the problems are so hidden. So this homeowner had owned the house about 14, 15 years. Every two or three years, he had someone treat the logs, fill in all the chinking, take care of all the problems. And then his window up here started getting cracks inside on the drywall. And the header over the garage door started to sag. And so there's what the header looks like. And that's a glue lamb. Um, and I won't tell you who built the house. I'm not, sure who, I'm not sure what company. Interestingly, this is a kit house. And the company does a lot of them. But they don't give you detailed instructions on how to install it. And the poor homeowner, he hired a carpenter, a good carpenter. A good carpenter who had never built a log-sided house. And he put it up the best he could. He didn't know any difference. And it, it, all kinds of construction details. So inside, this would be below one of those balconies. And take a note of these balconies. So what's holding up these balconies? They are not cantilevered. They're bolted to a rim joist, and they got this A-frame. So this is a structural carrying member right here. And that's holding up those balconies. Yeah, good-looking gutters. Look at the overhang. There's the other thing. Look at the overhang. Have you ever seen an old log house? The overhangs are two feet minimum, maybe three feet, and that's how they survived. Okay, so we're getting inside. We're looking at the cracks around the windows from structural movement. We're looking at inside the doors. Uh, there's water in there. You've got to get some screwdrivers with your name on, by the way. And then you can make sure they're in the pictures you take when you do legal work, you know, and it's yours forever. You Got to do that. Um, inside the door. Now we start to say, well, what's going on here? Here's the half logs, and here's the deck level. 
level. So where do you think the water's going to go? You think about it, typically when you step out to a deck, you step down to a deck, right? You can't have it level. How do you keep the water out of the inside? So this, here's, here's the deck. It looks even higher than, but actually it's the same height. But all this water is getting in through here because there's no separation, capillary action, there's no flashing. It's getting inside and wetting the areas below the carpet. So here's what's on the outside. Nothing to keep the water. So here's the deck, and half log, half log, half log. What keeps the water from flowing from the deck board in the assembly of the house? Absolutely nothing. And then other random areas of the house, because there's no overhang, there was a log home repair guy there, and he was all smiles. I'll show you all this stuff, you know. He had scaffolding all over, and he, here, let's wrap on this. So he starts, and the way he checks them is he hits them with a hammer. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd stay far away from these babies, but he hits it with a hammer and that chunk falls off. <laughs> well, there's a bad one right there. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no shit, wow. <laughs> the beauty of being a consultant is you can ask everybody else's opinion and put it in your report, because you sure don't know everything. I know about moisture, but I didn't know about log homes. Now this is below those deck areas. So the deck area you're bolted on with a metal bracket into the framing, and then this is support, this is support. And they set it on one of those half logs and no, there's a two by four wall. There's a two, no support at all. There's no support and not connected to the framing. It's sitting on the siding. So the siding of the house is supporting the decks. And I'm looking at this like, Oh my God, you know, I, I'm almost like you need somebody smarter than me. I, I can tell you what's wrong. I don't know how to fix it. Um, so there it is. There's the detail. There's the two by six, uh, maybe the two by six over here. And there's a half lock. So he shimmed it up with a piece of wood there to keep it flopping down and hitting us in the head because we're in the deck below there. And then look at these details. So where does the water go? You know, what do they tell you? Two inches of clearance, all kind of siding materials, flashings. I mean, this is all trapping water. This is all trapping water. Looks pretty. There's your overhangs. What do I see? 13 inches, maybe 14 inches, no gutters. There's underneath those decks. Um, there's some kind of a metal bracket here. And then they have a rigid foam. And then they had, they had some house wrap on the outside. And, you know, if a home inspector were to look at it, some of it, a lot of it looked just like this. Is that a problem? No. Well, maybe, maybe not. I guess get your hammer out and tap on every single log. So if you do home inspections of log homes, you need to charge a lot of money and spend a lot of time. And you need to tap every single, yep, I got some nods here. You got to tap every one of those. So there's the detail on the outside by some of the windows. This makes it look a little better, actually, but... This is pretty much flush with the inside. So here's what was going on. There were no flashings. The half side log siding, which leaks, it was laid down on the deck boards. The water just flowed right in there. And now it was next to the um, rigid board insulation and the water. Um, and the house wrap, wherever there was a gap, it was getting to the inside. Just a disaster. Hmm, there's another piece. OK. You all know this, right? This is kind of a standard chart for installing asphalt shingle roofs. If an asphalt shingle roof is um, 412 up to 1212, you use asphalt shingles, right? And below 412 down to 212, most of the manufacturers will allow you to do that with special precautions. And in general, their special precautions are several layers of tar paper, with the edges adhered together and lapped over six inches. Have you ever seen that done? No, sir. I've never. Okay, I've never seen it done. Hey, what they do in my neck of the woods is they put a, well, I'm going to put some house uh, ice and water shield under there, you know, and they put ice and water shield under there, which you know, keeps most of the water out, but not all the water, and all the water sits underneath there, and then all the fasteners rot away, and then all the shingles blow up. But anyway, they typically have some instructions for 212, and then between flat and 212, they, usually it's a membrane roof, right? 
So look at that house. What would you say that is? And I'll, this is an app you can get your, for your phone, by the way. It's called Roof Pitch Gauge. Called Pitch Gauge. Pitch Gauge, yeah. And so I took this with my Apple phone. So write down Pitch Gauge if you want. It's a, oh, I think I spent two bucks. It's free, it's free, but if you want a little bit better, you know, you spend two bucks. So there's the picture with Pitch Gauge. So what it does is that line is level, and it's telling me the pitch is one. 112 pitch. And I got called in on this as a consultant because the home inspector on this rehab house described this roof with pictures. There's the roof. There's the asphalt shingles. There's the 112 slope on the left. He described this roof as asphalt shingles installed on a low pitch roof. They may wear out quicker. And the guy's been in a home inspector for 30 years. I, he had to be hired by the he had to be hired by the uh, realtor. I, I don't know how he did that. So of course it la- it leaks, and then the guy who rehabbed the house came out and decided to put a bunch of heat tapes up there. That'll solve the problem. Put heat tapes up there. <laughs> That'll solve the problem. By the time I got involved, it's like you got to tear all this off and put a membrane roof in. But a home inspector actually that's how he described it. He kind of covered himself and he said that it's. You know, I think he may have said improperly stalled and it will uh, fail prematurely. That's what he said, it will fail prematurely. That is not fail prematurely. That is improperly installed roofing materials and it will leak, period. Carpenters and mold guys love humidifiers. We talked about humidifiers a little bit. Homeowners don't understand humidifiers. So this guy grows orchids in his lean-to sunroom in the back of his house. And he's got all kinds of moisture there to keep the orchids going. And he called me to his house. He's a computer engineer. He's an engineer, self-described engineer. And I'm sure he's a graduate. And I got this moisture problem in my house. Okay, well, I'll come and look. I said, well, how's your humidifier? Well, I know it's working. I know it's working. Everything is right. Okay, so I get to his house. Go into the basement. And there's water running out of this thing like crazy. So this is, you know, the type of humidification where you run it across the panel and the water drains away. And he walks me over to it, and I'm looking at it, and he says, see, it's water running out the bottom. That's how it works all the time. He said, it's dehumidifying the house like crazy. Look at all the water it's taken out. <laughs> so I wanted to charge him 400 bucks and tell him, to, thank you, here's your problem, turn it off. But... I went, I went through the house with him. Um, so here's the setting. That's, what is this at? 60%. And this is, this is Wisconsin weather. This is, you know, 20 degrees outside, zero degrees outside. This is the closet in the upper level, all moldy. Um, there's the mold in the closet. There's the closet, the outside wall in the closet, all this water damage. Mm, so what do you think's going on? Well, it's condensation in the attic. And then here's the well, here's a window, a bunch of condensation on the windows. And, and most of the times that doesn't mean anything, a little condensation on windows in my climate. When it gets to be 12 or 10 degrees outside, you get condensation on windows. Now, now we're in the attic. So I get my head up there and I start taking pictures. These are the two bath exhaust fans connected to something. I'm not, not exactly sure. This, there's some shoots for the ventilation, but look at all this black stuff. That's the north side. No sunlight, nothing warming it up. The next, next picture I take, my glasses are fogged up, my camera's <laughs> fogged up. I couldn't, even take, I couldn't even take a picture. It was so foggy after I had to come down and wipe the lens off. You know? So, you know, guess what? It's 100% rolls of humidity up there. Moisture condensing everywhere. And so that is another part of the north side where it's icy. And then there's looking down the center. It's all, that's good green and black. And you know, the old guys that love that one. You know, there we go. There's some good green stuff. But that's on the south side. So it's not wet right now. It's just moldy. And the guy was just killing his house with a humidifier. I mean, it was that simple. Turn your humidifier off and good luck getting your house cleaned up. I mean, you got a real mess here. Uh, but he thought the... Humidifier was a dehumidifier. The biggest problem with 
Condensation and moisture in attics is air leaks. A hundred percent, it's air leaks. And the gentleman earlier today had a pretty good demonstration. Uh, explanation of that about uncontrolled air, but I will tell you, it's not ventilation, it's not insulation, it's air leaks. 100%. The problem is always air leaks. And where does the air leak? Everywhere. Every little gap. There's got to be, what, two or three inches around a masonry chimney, every electrical box, the attic hatch, plumbing. That's what causes problems. This is something you may not have seen before. But it is very common, and it can cause huge problems in modern construction. So here we have an interior partition wall. Here we have an attic with, you know, R40, R50. Here's a drywall. Here's a vapor barrier. How do they put those vapor barriers in? They run them to the edge of the drywall and maybe wrap, wrap it a little bit, and then they shove the other piece of drywall off. They do not take it over the top of the plate, do they? It's never over the top of the plate. And then what happens when the house dries out? Those always shrink. And the shrinkage isn't along the long dimension, it's across the width. And there's, there'll be gaps everywhere right here. And then you've got an electrical outlet, and then you run your humidifier at 60%, and then you've got warm, moist air pushing up here 24-7, and you've got a moisture problem in the attic. And that is a huge contributor to moisture problems in attics of cold climate houses. So here I am. In an attic, this is about a 10-year-old house, really a pretty house. And I pulled up this piece of insulation next to the hatch. And here's the edge of a partition wall. So there's no vapor barrier under right here where this framing is. And there's the edge right there. So there's the edge. And so what's the fiberglass doing? It's a great filter, right? All that air is flowing up into the attic. The fiberglass filtering the dirt out. And all that moisture just going up in the attic. And it's got a vapor barrier installed correctly. It just doesn't seal the top plates. Chimneys. So masonry chimney, 1970s house. Eh, that's probably a little closer than it's supposed to be. Now we use what? We use metal or drywall or non-combustible material and special sealants and caulks. But look at this black fiberglass that I pulled back. And why is it black? Because of air leaks. So whenever you see black fiberglass, it's air leaks. It's acting as a filter, and that warm, moist air just coming up and filtering out the dust. This was a house that I looked at, and quite honestly, the person buying it noticed the stain. I didn't even see it. And I always tell my customers, you know, four eyes are better than two, six eyes are better than two. Whatever you see that you wonder about, tell me about I do use a moisture meter. I think it's a valuable tool. I'll check surfaces that look like they're water damaged. Sometimes I can say, well, it's water damaged, but it's totally dry right now. Now you need to go back to the cellar of the house to find out what's going on. Well, in this case, here's a spot, and it's measuring 50% dampness. And there was no obvious reason for that. There's no window above it. It was in the lower level of a house. There's no plumbing above it. There was nothing above it. And um, the lady buying the house was really, you know, I wrote it up. I said, I had no idea. So they pulled it open, and guess what, guess what was up there? A yeah, mouse nest. Yeah, it was a mouse nest. So I immediately cleaned all my tools, you know. Um, no. It was a mouse nest, yeah, and they're peeing up there in that area, in this mouse pee. I tell you, I learned something on that one. That was just this summer I saw that. I'd never seen that before. Okay, this is from that article I wrote for the Ashy Journal. Um, and almost always I would tell you this kind of staining on a basement wall is because of poor surface drainage. Almost always is. Because obviously the water's coming in at the top and pushing through the block. The salty stains are efflorescence, not effervescence, efflorescence. I get that wrong all the time, okay? Um, and as moisture pushes through block, it brings in mortar, it brings through some lime and some salt stains, so that's why it looks salty. You ever taste that stuff? I, I haven't, but someone told me it tastes salty. I almost tasted that spot in the ceiling where the... <laughs> 
I am glad I didn't. Here's the outside of the house. Now, I did not do this as a home inspector. I did this in investigating moisture. Boy, you look at this. That looks real pretty. I mean, wow, that's a nice looking house. I guess I was there in 2013. Um, but then there's no overhang to speak of. And that faces north and northwest where all the prevailing winds hit in my neck of the woods. And then because it wasn't a home inspection, we pulled away some of the bark chips and dirt. So there's the brick. It's, it's full brick veneer resting on the foundation wall. Oh, there's no flashing and no weeps. Hmm. Now, on residential construction where I live, they almost never install flashing and weeps. They just don't do it. I don't know what you see. How many people see flashing and weeps everywhere? They see it. Okay, how many people don't see flashing and weeps? Right. They just don't do it. And many times, there's no issue at all. But in this case, no overhang and facing north, prevailing winds. So the wind is driven rain is saturating this brick, and it's coming down to the bottom, and there's no flashing and no weeps. And here's what's going on. So just imagine this goes all the way up, but the water's coming through the brick. There may or may not be house wrap. I don't know. I can't see that. But it's coming down to the top of the block wall, and it's showing up as stains in the block wall. So it's a masonry veneer leak that's causing this guy's problem. This is the way it's supposed to be, and this is the way the old guys used to do it. <clears throat> In this case, a block basement wall, a flashing. A lot of times, I'll see copper once in a while, but they use membranes. They use a membrane material. Yeah. And then there's house wrap over the top, supposed to be one inch of space to stop capillary action. Any water that comes through should run down the back, be contained by the house wrap and the flashing, and drip to the outside. And then you'll see a little weep hole. You know what the weep holes look like with the little nylon rope in there? Yeah. You know what the nylon rope is for? Keep the bugs out. Yeah. Keep the bugs out. So anyway, um, I told the guy he's got to pull all the brick veneer off the whole house. <laughs> and he didn't like that. And I said, well, then you could try sealant with a silane-type sealer because it'll so let it breathe, but it may stop bulk moisture and then pull all the surface drainage away, pull the dirt away on the outside, and at least put 12 inches of gravel there, six inches out and 12 inches down. So if the water gets down there, maybe it won't be stopped by the clay. Maybe it'll drain to the outside. And the only other alternative is just you know, pull the brick veneer off and do it right. No simple fix. This is a bonus room closet over a garage, unheated garage. So the blue carpeting is a bedroom. This is a little closet the guy built over the garage. And he's like, man, I'm getting mold. Mold on this threshold. And I've had the heating guy out, and I've had the um, insulation guy out, and I've had, and nobody can figure this out. So that's what it looks like. So any ideas? So the... It, the, this, you got to go to the mic if you want to if you want anybody to hear you. So, but the the closet was unheated, the bedroom was heated. So the bedroom's under a little bit of positive pressure. The bedroom's pushing air, warm moist air, underneath the door. As soon as it hit this part of the door jam, it was very cold, and it was condensing as moisture and mold was growing. It's back to that old why would mold grow there? Why would it condense there? And I just told the guy. I said, hey, buddy, it's below, my wife knows it's below the dew point temperature. I should have taken her with. I should have brought Gail with. I said, honey, what's going on here? Well, hey, buddy, the temperature of the sill is below the dew point temperature. So inside, <laughs> quite honestly, I, I get lots of calls these days about moisture and attics and things. And I always tell them. Hire an insulation contractor and ask them what they know about air sealing if they kind of give you the old quizzical look. I don't know. Hire a different guy and just get a good person to air seal your attic and it solves all your problems. Solves ice dam problems, solves condensation, solves rot. It just solves everything. you got to air seal it. Anyway, this is a, in a garage, 1970s house. You know, you often see stains like that inside of a garage. That didn't get me too excited. 
Um, eh, there's a little more than you'd like to see. Um, this you can't see very well, but this is the block basement wall, and this is all stained in the band joist area, no insulation. Yeah, you know, that's concerning. So then I went outside. So this is the garage wall. This is the um, 1 by 12 cedar siding with the battens. This is the stone veneer. And then this is the cap. And where's the flashing? You know, it's like, how's it been here a long time? So here I am sticking my finger in a hole. Wow, yeah, you think some water? Let's pour some water in here and see what happens, you know. <laughs> and I was doing this inspection for a new buyer. And I'm like, you know, this is the problem. And they're, oh, there, he filled it up a lot more caulk. It's just totally wrong. And that stone is actually starting to move a little bit. Um, and this is, this, is the, uh, this is the problem. So no flashing here. The water's getting in, coming down. In the garage case, there's no, no uh, drywall and there's no um, <clears throat> vapor barrier of any kind. So you can see all the dampness. And then in the basement, you see the dampness there. Pretty serious problem. Um, things that you need to identify, though. Now, is the house going to fall down? It's been there 30 years. Probably not. But you sure don't want the contractor to go in. You know what the contractor is going to tell the homeowner? Your home inspector should have seen that. Yeah. Home inspector is supposed to know everything. So I always identify those things. You know, I don't think people may have bought the house. I don't know. But I told them it's a serious issue. It's obviously leaking water. It will continue to leak, continue to get wrong, uh, get worse. The only way to know what's really going on is start pulling things apart, and I, I don't do that. So you need a specialist to come in and pull it apart and take a look at it. If they bought the house or not. This is the right way to do it. So here's the siding material. Here's a metal flashing that over the edge. There's the house wrap that goes down or building paper, and here's another flashing. So who sees this detail when you have a part wall like that? I see it once out of a once out of a hundred. Maybe. Sometimes you'll see a little piece of metal over the top of a, a stone that's pitched, and I'm thrilled to see that. I'm like, wow, hey, there's, there's something there. Leak at the top of the window. This changed the way I do inspections. I got called into this one. <clears throat> they were very happy with their home inspector, but they had this consistent leak, and the leak was occurring right here, and this is a bayed out area. Okay, so uh, let's see. They call that a bay window, not a bow window. It's a bay window. And that's the only evidence of a leak. So I'm lifting up the curtains, and there's the leak. And, but they said water pours out of there. They'll collect a cup of water during a, during a good rainstorm. And I'm like, wow, you know, a home inspector never would have seen this. Um, here's a, here it is on the outside. So this is what's changed about my inspections over the years. Lack of an overhang, uh, that's a problem. Brick veneer, two-story, uh, that sucks in a lot of water. A penetration that sticks out. There should be a through the brick flashing right here. Actually, a pan flashing all the way through that collects the water and gets it to the outside. Otherwise, the water's going to get in behind the brick, run down, and leak in the window. And do you ever seen a pan flashing in a window like that? Never. Not in my neck of the woods. They just don't do it. You should see a flashing. You should see weep holes. You should see a piece of metal coming to the outside. So this is the sill of the window up above. So this is measuring the sill. And, oh, gee, it, it pitches the wrong way. It tips inward. So where do you think that water is going? You know, it's going into the wall structure. And then someone came back and decided, well, I'll fix it. I'll put a flashing here. Well, you know, it doesn't do any good because it doesn't go through the wall. You've got to go through the wall. So luckily I didn't do. I was just a consultant in on that one. Um, this is what you should see over. Well, this is just a window that's flush. But you should see the lintel and then you should see flashing. And then you should see no caulk here. <laughs> Um, but it's very rarely done that way. So the water gets in behind and comes out the bottom. And there I'm showing the correct flashing detail. And just always remember, brick leaks. And then there's the correct detail. Um, 
window, brick, lintel, flashing, house wrap. Should be weep holes there. They always caulk that. So, 10-year-old house. Now, that one looks good. This is an inspection I did. To me, oh, that looks pretty good. But then I'm thinking, ah, what about the, that sticks away from the house and there's no, no overhangs at all. It's on the north side. It's going to get a bunch of wind-driven rain. So then I'm looking closer right here. Oh, that's got all fresh paint. Looks good. They painted it up to sell the house. So then I put my ladder up there, my little giant. There's the edge of my little giant. And I could poke my finger right through here. There's no flashing there. There should be a flashing there and to get the water to the outside. So 15-year-old mm, house, the water just sits there, sits there. They caulked it and painted it, made it look nice. And then the, the buyer says, uh, what do I have to do to fix that? <laughs> And I'm kind of like, you tear the whole thing apart and start over. It's all going to be rotted behind there. You don't have much choice. So that's the kind of flashing you should see over the top of um, the horizontal pieces of trim, and the piece we just looked at. Um, they don't usually do this detail right, but at least if there's something there, it makes you feel better. So here's a window with some rot. At least a little. I, now, I did this presentation and some Chicago guy in the front row. And then I'm saying, you know, this doesn't look good. And the Chicago guy says, anybody here from Chicago, by the way? Yeah. Chicago, you know, the Chicago guy says, ah, all our houses look like that. <laughs> you not standard conditions, you know. Um, I did a presentation in Chicago last winter, and it was cold. And it was so cold. My wife and I did a little touring in downtown, and we were next to the county courthouse. And it was so cold in Chicago that I saw two Chicago politicians with their hands in their own pockets. <laughs> anyway, I'm looking at this on the outside thinking, boy, that doesn't look so good. But then again, you know, you get a little rot. Then you go to the inside. It's hard to see here. But this whole window dropped down about a half an inch. The whole thing just dropped down about a half an inch. So what that tells me is the framing all around that window is bad. And I'd never seen that before. And then here's this rod here. And I guess the lesson in this is that isn't just rotted frame or trim. That could be rot behind it. So that's one of those details where you want to say requires further investigation. And this window actually had a little cap flashing. What I would suspect is there's no house wrap underneath these boards in in my neck of the woods in the 70s, some smart person decided they didn't need house wrap. It's kind of like it wasn't required. Absolutely, it wasn't required by the code. Wisconsin's a little bit unique because we have our own building code, Uniform Dwelling Code, and it wasn't required. The requirement was the walls need to be watertight prior to installing insulation. That's what all the code said. And didn't say you needed a moisture barrier on the outside. So I suspect there's no moisture barrier on the outside. Um, and I don't like the fact that it tips in, but that isn't causing all the problems. And that's just a bottom view of that. So again, this is what we should have seen on top of the window. The key to this is there should be house wrap, and that flashing should go up underneath the house wrap. But home inspectors can't see that. And the lesson is, when you see rotted wood like that, call it out as a problem requiring further investigation and repair. So, this was a consulting job I did for a gentleman who was really an industrious guy. So he bought this house, and he's got all these moisture problems. And the first thing I noticed was, he came up to the house. Here's a patio that someone else had installed. He only owned it for a few months. And where's the step up into the house? The patio, this is the house on a slab. We don't see many of those in Wisconsin. The patio is the same height as the slab inside the house. And to me, that's like red flags, red flags, red flags. I've learned that it's a sidewalk in front of the house or the patio. There's no step up. That means the patio is the same height as the floor. That means wooden structures buried in the ground. That means problem. So this is a good example of uh, here's the patio slab. There's the slab for the house, same height. Here's a good example of how siding all leaks. This had that, they call it beaver board where I'm from. I don't know what you guys called that, that 1960s cellulose. Yeah, that's that stuff. Um, 
But look at how much that siding leaked and damages all that. The interesting thing about this is this is an older part of the house, and it's got all new insulation and boards replaced. Huh, how did that happen? So this guy was real creative. He's tearing everything apart. So here's the patio. There's the framing. Where's the sill a plate? You know, it's all rotted away. And the materials inside said that it was, uh, you know, this was like five years old. Everything's about five years old. So the owner had all these problems. He covered it all up and sold it to this guy. There's the patio, the same height inside. So there's, re there's re reasons they have rules. And the state of Wisconsin code is probably similar to the uh, international code, but the soil on the outside of the house is supposed to be six inches below the top of the foundation. And that would be true for a patio slab, too. And when it's not six inches below, problems. Because you've got all of this wood framing buried in the dirt. Problems. There's that house that shows how the siding's leaking. So, this was an insurance company situation. Insurance company wanted to figure out <laughs> a reason to deny a claim, of course. You know, that's why they hired me. Uh, I don't get a lot of insurance company work. <laughs> they, don't, they don't like me much. Are they like 10 inch rises on the steps? Yeah, nice, nice little Cape Cod house. And the problem was water running out of the uh, attic and staining the upstairs. Now, this is an old Cape Cod house that never had any insulation to speak of. And they never had moisture problems in these 1950s houses. If you don't modify the house, and you've probably seen a bunch of them, have you ever seen a moisture problem in a 1950s house in old Cape Cod? Never. And why is that? And even they take the bath end and dump it in the attic, right? They just dump it in the attic. There's no vapor barrier. and There's very little bit of insulation. Why do you never have a moisture problem in a 1950s house unless it's modified? because the temperature never gets below the dew point temperature. That's why. It never gets below the dew point temperature. The attic framing is nice and roasty, toasty warm because all the heat leaks up there. The roof deck is roasty, toasty warm. All the snow melts off the roof. It never gets cold. If it never gets below the dew point temperature, you never have a moisture problem. Then you add insulation and you stop that flow of heat and you put a vapor barrier in there that isn't effective, that's got a whole bunch of holes in it. So now you've got a cold attic, you got moisture leaks, and you got all kinds of condensation because the roof deck is below the dew point temperature, and the reason it's below the dew point temperature is someone insulated it. The structure, that is. So there's the attic. That's a pretty one, isn't it? That's really looking good. And then there's the gaps. So this is like a closet in the second story. Look at all these gaps for air to get up in the attic. And then he was doing some remodeling, pulling off some walls, a whole bunch of gaps. And there's the culprit. Ain't that something? One of those humidifier deals. And there's the setting. I don't know if I can quite see that. It must have been set to like 60% relative humidity. And they had a little, a little baby in the house, and they were worried about humidity. And they're killing their house in the meantime. Talked about air leaks. It's always the air leaks. And in that house we just looked at, had he had a good effective air barrier and a vapor barrier, he wouldn't have had those problems. Faux stone. Looks pretty. Home inspector would be saying, wow, that's cool. Well, that looks good, you know. The, the Masons in my part of town call that faux stone lick and stick. Ever hear that expression? Because they just smear a little more. It's, it's OSB, and then they hopefully put a couple layers of house wrap up, and supposedly the drainage type house wrap, which they never use. I actually think tar paper might be better. And then they staple up some mesh, and they smear some mortar on, and they start lick and sticking the, the stones up. And boy, it looks nice. But the problem is, for many years, it's been installed incorrectly. So here's the inside underneath this window. And by the way, I did not do the home inspection on this. I'm glad I didn't. This is a lady who owned it for like 15 years, and 
she couldn't solve this moisture problem. So here's inside. We got a rusty nail. We got see that maybe 99 percent. 99 percent. That's my good old Aquant. I like that one. Um, yeah, it's been already painted and patched a couple of times. Here's the above the basement wall, below that area. So we're getting some black stains and a high moisture reading there. And then I start looking outside closer. So what do you see missing? Flashings. There are no flashings. This is lick and stick, man. That's a quarter inch thick. This is a piece of cedar or something. Where is the flashing to get the water to the outside? There ain't no flashing. This is the garage on the house. Same house. Um, and I always love looking at the base in, below garage windows. So there's below the garage window. It's same situation. The water's hitting the window frame. It's coming down behind the brick veneer. The, and I want to call it brick veneer. The lick and stick. It's hitting the window frames. It's running around the flange of the window. And in this case, it's coming. Usually you see it on the edge of the window because the water runs around. In this case, it was two windows that must have been put together coming in here. How many people see that in garages from time to time? What do you tell the homeowner about the rest of the house? I mean, I'm telling them you potentially have this problem throughout your house, and that would be the smart thing to tell them. Um, I don't know what else you could tell them, but I always find it amazing at garage windows how many times you see stains below garage windows, all the times in my neck of the woods. Um, so how should you install the faux stone? Faux stone should be installed like ethos or synthetic plaster or stove, drive it, whatever you call it. It's supposed to have flashing. It's supposed to have spacing. It's in, in my neck of the woods, they just don't do it right. How is, do, do people have areas of the country where faux stone's installed correctly? Yeah. Incorrectly? Yeah. It's a huge problem. And it, the issue is... Since everybody's doing it incorrectly, very few people know how to do it correctly. Uh, in Wisconsin now, there's a couple of gentlemen who do consulting work in this area, and they know how to do it correctly. And I keep encouraging contractors to go into that business. It's going to be a huge business. Full, I'm the expert full stone repair guy. Call me up, and I'll have unlimited business. Um, this is the house owned by an engineer and a stay-at-home mom who was a big litigating attorney with one of the big shot attorney firms in Wisconsin. And I mean big shot litigating attorney in one of the bigger firms. So they decide to put a deck on the back of their house, a 12 year old house. And here's what they find. So like I just said before, the water gets behind the siding. This is wood siding. There is no house wrap. It comes down to the window. That must be a one-piece window. Runs over the edges, comes down the sides, and here's all the wood rot around the windows. 12-year-old house. They were pulling this off because they wanted to attach a deck. And um, the attorney who lived there was really afraid of bugs, and she saw some carpenter ants and bugs, so she had her husband throw some white, I don't know, white bug killer against there, so that's the white stuff. Um, Anyway, uh, I gave her all the information she needed to talk to the builder about how it was built wrong. The problem is, in Wisconsin, during that period of time, there was no specific requirement for a moisture barrier on the outside. Now, they fixed that now, um, but that's a real common problem. And when you're looking at a house like that, in my neck of the woods, you want to always look at the chimney, because even if they put house wrap around the house, why would you wrap the chimney, the wood frame chimney? Because the wood frame chimney is not part of the house, right? And they'd never wrap the wood frame chimneys, and you have moisture problems there. Or peeling paint on chimneys, always a problem. Um, this is pretty straightforward, pretty serious. I'm not sure how it ever got resolved. This is the castle, and it's out in the Lake Country area outside Milwaukee. A dentist built this. He hired a architectural student. Yeah, dentists must make a little bit of money. It had to be 10, 12, 15,000 square feet. I don't know. 
I was just there to look at moisture. At this point, it's about six years old. And it's total stone until you get to the parapet walls up here. And then this is lick and stick. It's natural stone cut very thin and stuck to an OSB surface. The mistake the guy made is he hired a, an architectural student, not an architect, to do the design. And they did a pretty good design on the house, but totally forgot about vapor and moisture barriers, and in this case, moisture barriers. So he was having some leaking into the house, and he had some water appearing on the third level. And by the time I got there, this was the conditions that he was looking at, and he was already starting to pull things apart. So this stone would appear to be solid, but it's not. It's actually a quarried stone uh, out of Lannan, Wisconsin. We call it Lannan, Wisconsin. It's a limestone. And they cut these into L pieces. So that's an L piece of stone um, stuck onto the mortar with an OSB Wuzzwood substrate. And so what do you think's happening? Where is the flashing? Where's the cap? What's keeping water out of the structure? So the water's getting into the OSB. The OSB is expanding. It's captured in these stones and cracks the stones apart. This is uh, one of the interior roof areas. So this is all the lick and stick stone, real stone, thin stone, no flashings, no overhangs, water gets in behind, no proper lapping of the house wrap over the top of a step flashing. And here's where you had leaks down below. And it's just like pull the whole upper part of the house apart, period. That's about all you're going to do with it. And there we are. He put some tar paper back in and tried to create a little bit of a flashing to stop the leaks. But you can see how thin that stone is now. So a real stone veneer cut to be a lick and stick. The interesting part about that is when you're buying that from the local quarry, which is a huge company, there's no directions, no instructions, nothing about how to install it. Now, the manufacturers of the faux stone, the lick and stick faux stone, now have instructions and now have requirements. And in fact, there's an association of fake stone installers, I don't know what it's called, um, and they actually have instructions. Two layers of membrane, um, certain kind of mesh and certain kind of spacing, flashings as if you were installing, stow or drive it. But when this was done, there was no instructions of any kind. Chimney chases. So it's nice to put a house wrap around the house, but why would you wrap the chimney chase? You know, that's not part of the house. The problem is all siding leaks. And when the first Tyvek came out 35 years ago, Tyvek was sold as what? An air barrier. It was strictly sold as an air barrier. And the first Tyvek actually often went under the OSB because it was an air barrier. And then about 25 years ago, they decided Tyvek should be sold as a moisture and air barrier. So now it's sold as a moisture barrier. The old time carpenters used to always use tar paper or 15 pound felt and lapped it properly. That was their moisture barrier. But now they designed Tyvek and now other house wraps to replace it. Well, why would you house wrap or Tyvek a chimney chase? Because you're not carry, you don't care about wind getting in a chimney chase. Who cares? Well. It's because all siding leaks, and it causes a bunch of rot. So luckily for this young couple, um, home inspector didn't see any of this. I don't think anybody would have seen any of this. Um, luckily, it was just a chimney chase that needed to be pulled apart. The rest of the house had house around. Oh, I forgot to turn my name up on the screwdriver. Uh, it says Tom. It says Tom Faisal. Let me tell you. I, There's the OSB was wood. Ain't that something? Okay. Leak on the top of a poured concrete wall. Window well, deep window well here. Uh, unfinished. Leak on the top. So what does that tell you? What do you think that is? Grading. Yeah, probably grading. Defect. Do I write it up as a big deal? Mm, in this case, no. I go to the outside. It gets cold in Wisconsin, by the way, and we do get some snow in Wisconsin. 
So there's that window well. There's the hose bib leaking water, <laughs> dribbling right as we speak. And that's the wet spot down there. Well, it's just a hose bib problem. So all leaks aren't bad leaks. Sometimes you can tell people how to correct them. You know, make sure you get the hose bib turned off in the wintertime. So what would you look what would you say now if you looked at this house? Call Tom. Call Tom, yeah, you would think, hmm. That's a good answer, call Tom. The logical thing is you really need to be careful with all kinds of fold stones. You just really need to be careful with that. So this is the same house with a little more detail. That's that house that had that leak. And then you can see where the shutters are pulling away and the shutters are pulling away. So I mean, most of you folks would identify that as some serious issues, right? Water getting in, moisture problems, lack of flashing, yeah. So full stone leaks, it should be flashed like ethos or stow or drive it. That's pretty much where the industry is going with that. And like I said, they have established an industry standard, and they've established an association of Fosto manufacturers. I'm not sure exactly what the name is, and now they started to address. Say that again? MVNA. MVNA. M manufactured Masonry Veneer Association. Association. Okay. Um, so that's a good thing. FEMA? FEMA. I don't hear so good. You know, my wife says I don't look so good, but I say I don't hear so good. EIMA. EIMA. E and what does that stand for? East Industry Manufacturing. All right, that's logical. Do you know? Think about this now. If everything was logical, like that answer, if everything was logical, men would ride horses side saddle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a full depth basement, typical Wisconsin home. Here's the post for the steel beam up above. Here's um, um, PVC drainage, yeah. And here's a bunch of salty stuff and a damp floor. So what do you think? I took that picture in 2012. Sure, what do you think? Out. I have no idea. <laughs> I told the people, I said, there's water under there, and the water's capillary action is bringing the water up through the concrete, and that's what's sort of bringing the salt. Say. It's probably a broken sewer line underneath there. But, you know, as a home inspector, I'm like, I have no explanation for that. I just thought it was a cool picture I should show everybody. <laughs> That's why I took it. That's cool, man. Look at all that salt. And by the way, that tasted like salt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Since it was on the floor, I figured, what the heck, you know? So this is a brand new house, three or four years old when I looked at it. And I'm holding up a picture of water intrusion of this spot that the homeowner took two years, three years earlier. And after the builder did all the fixes, he still had the same leaks. These same areas were getting damp and wet. So that's two, three years ago, and this is today. And so he's got a bunch of moisture intrusion through the block, center of the wall. And that's occurring on certain areas. So here we got some moisture here. You know, that goes up pretty high, so you think that's surface drainage. Um, I'm not sure about that. Here we got some moisture coming in high on the wall. You know, maybe something going on there. Um, every time it rained, the walls got wet. The builder spent, well, I should say, it was a brand new house he built. The guy's name was Pouchet, Oak Creek, Wisconsin. Really nice guy. Um, the builder spent two or three years trying to solve the problem. They had basement consultants. They had basement repair. They spent at least $10,000. They dug the whole basement up on the outside. They waterproofed it from the outside. 
They tarred it all, and in my neck of the woods, they'll put a tar-type substance up, and then they'll put a sheet of visqueen up, and then they backfill with gravel from the footing all the way to grade, uh, except maybe the last 18 inches, they'll put some clay soil in there. And after all that work was done, dug the whole house up, basement still leaked. So then it's like, you know, call Tom. Yeah, I'll come on, I'll take your money. All right, let me see. Um, there's another spot in the front of the house that's getting wet, still getting wet, and that would be like where the front, where the front door is. So what do you think the problem was? Yeah, siding and improper flashings. And they spent at least $20,000 before I got there. So this is the front of the house. Um, real brick veneer, real cut stone. Eh, there's a little flashing there. This is cement board. Um, so it's a hardy cement board or something. Um, on the side of the house is all vinyl around the back. And there was staining down below here in the basement. Tom? Question? Yes. I wonder if you've run into any issues with zip system. Say that again. What system? Zip system. You, did I have one on the back of my neck? No. Zip. Z-I-P. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Uh, zip, no. I, I, that's not common where I am. I, I've seen them. I've seen pictures of them. It's really cool when you see that system. That's where they have the taped joints. Yeah. And the, yeah, and you see them in the magazine. I saw a house like that once, all taped up like that in North Carolina. Man, I took a bunch of pictures. It's, it's, like, all, wow. in my, it's all in my air. I was just wondering if you've had yeah. any issues. Are there problems with those systems that people should know about? Not that I've heard yet. I was, I was hoping you might know some. No, I don't know about it. So I've got a book for your question. So when you come up later, come up and grab this book. But I'm giving away at my booth, too. But there's a free book. No, the only thing about Zip. Um, so here we go. Here's the this fiber cement siding. Here's the stone sill. Oh, it doesn't slope away. Hmm. Oh, and part of the fix, there's the flashing. Part of the fix, they caulked it all up. Well, why not caulk it all up? But actually, that caulk is between the stone and the metal, so it doesn't really hurt anything. And then here's the back of the house. So the back of the house is all vinyl siding. Some of the leaks I showed you were right here below this bait out area. Some of the leaks were over here in this corner. Some of the leaks were right in here. Patio slopes away. Eh, the overhangs aren't much for overhangs. That's a potential problem. Um, you kind of wonder about flashing over the curved top windows and things like that. Um, after I did some basic look see, I pretty much decided it was a siding installation and, and um, flashing problem. So here we are starting to pull off siding to do some investigation. And uh, I think that might be my little giant ladder right there. Uh, we got one little piece of siding pulled off here. Now, look at the surface drainage. And look at this. This is all stone. It's all gravel underneath all the way down. And it's still leaking. So there's what we see. So let's see. The house wrap is... And the flashing is, and this may have been built when house wrap was required. I believe it was built when house wrap was required. So the kick out flashing is, <laughs> and the siding is, has set in a J channel, and the J channel is dumping behind, and we got all kinds of gaps here. And why we have some was wood and some polyisocyanurate, I'm not sure what's what. But, you know, what's going to keep the water out? All the water is getting into this structure and then going to run down to the basement. No, because it's a new house. The staining was down in the basement. Um, and, you know, who knows? Maybe this never did get wet, but certainly there's some water ran down here. Yeah, no, there was no, there was no kickoff flashing there. There was nothing. So here we are. Um, the fix to the house was to pull all the siding off, pull the veneer off, the vinyl off, and and this point in time, this was about ten years ago, um, there was no detail provided by Tyvac uh, to wrap existing windows. So the only way to do it correctly, and now when you do things like this and you're acting as a consultant, 
you've got a contractor who is jittery as can be because they're already suing the builder. They got a basement leak, and now you got to find somebody to come in and fix it. So, you know, these guys, there's a lot of guys that don't want to get involved in that at all. Uh, they've got a few contractors who are willing. So he, this guy was willing to get involved. And, uh, and we're talking, you know, I, spend a, I talk to contractors a lot. Well, what do you suggest? What do you recommend? And when I do work as a consultant, I'll do that a lot. I'll talk to the contractors, uh, the good contractors. And we came to the conclusion the only way to do this right is pull all the windows. So we pulled all the windows out. Now, there were drywall returns on the inside, which came apart pretty well, so it really wasn't all that bad. We pulled all these windows out because we wanted to get the house wrap lapped properly, and we wanted to get the house wrap up underneath all the sills and get some sill flashing. And you can't do that with the windows and doors in the way. So we pulled it all, and then this is what was below the patio door in the back. And like I said, the water hits the top of the frame, it runs around the J channel, around the um, flange, and comes running out the bottom, and there was a wet spot in the basement right there. Cool, huh? So we don't build them like we used to. And in order to be a really good home inspector, I think you need to understand some of these building science topics. And I, and I hope I gave you some pretty good information and things that you can use. Now, I would invite anybody with questions to come up and use the microphone, but you've got to come up and use the microphone because we want it to go on the recording, and I'd be happy to answer. We've got a few minutes to answer questions. We would inspect a lot of 1950s houses without any insulation in the attic, and I've always in the past recommended, hey, you know, in, insulate the uh, attic now for, for more energy efficiency, and that's right. really the wrong thing to do. It's the right thing to do. But what I say now, and I said that for many years, what I say is air seal and insulate the attic. So you've got to air seal it and insulate the attic, and then there won't be a problem. You'll seal that up. You won't have the air leaks. And quite honestly, air sealing can be done pretty effectively to catch the big holes. I mean, the big holes are around the chimneys. Um, I got called into a water leak problem where there was a two-inch gap around the chimney, and then all the warm, moist air was going up to the chimney flashing. And it was raining, and there was icicles hanging there. And the guy's like, the roofer screwed this up. And I'm like, no, the air leaks up the, chim up the edge of the chimney, and that's the problem. So the key is air sealing and then insulation. Yes, sir? Cathedral ceilings, um, ice dam problems with canned lights. Yes. Any way to resolve the issue with the canned lights and keep the canned lights on an existing structure. I don't know any good way to do that. I always tell people, eliminate can lights. The insulation contract contact, IC lights, supposedly can be packed with insulation. Well, they're not airtight. So now they make insulation contract AT, I think they call them, airtight fixtures. They are not airtight. They still leak. So there is some allowances to build a can around those. But then you, you, each municipality interprets that differently. Where I'm from, they can build a can of non-combustible materials. So you can buy a can made out of fiberglass, or you can build it out of uh, cement board. And then you caulk and seal that around the IC fixture. If the IC fixture overheats, it just turns off because it's, it's got the thermal overload in it. But the best thing is to just eliminate them. They're just a constant, yeah. Eliminate them, put in track lights, seal up the opening a bad thing. Oh, well, I've heard a guy say you could take the LED lights and put the seal around the new yes. LED lights and seal up that whole recessed light can. I haven't tried it. My question to you is, um, is there a paint on air barrier you could put on top of the walls where they meet the attic floor where the polyethylene or visqueen is not there? Is there something you can paint on there fast? Mm, or from the inside, no. No. no you got to go up. you got to get up above and... and Two things. Well, from, from the attic. From the attic. The well, from the attic, yeah. Um, Dowel or DuPont makes a product that's a non-expanding, gooey, sticky foam stuff. You can spray it on there or an expanding uh, one-part foam, like a great stuff. Mm -hmm. You don't need to stop at 100%. You just need uh, to stop uh, the big old things. Mobile home roof paint? But, Would that be heavy enough? I don't know about that. The sealant guys, they have special sealants. Mm -hmm. Well, I built a new house eight years ago, 
And what I did is the tops, before the house was insulated, I was being built, the tops of all the partition walls, we spray foamed them with about an inch of foam. Mm -hmm. And on the outside walls, they're spray foamed. And we put the air chutes in, shove some insulation and hold it in place and spray foam the whole thing in place. Mm -hmm. And it's fantastic. And the, the deal with heat and air loss and air movement, if you think of a wall cavity, a wall stud cavity, it can have all kinds of holes in it. But if you seal the top and seal the bottom, you don't have that flow. And so that's the key. I seal the top. I seal the bottom. The sill plate in my house is all foamed. And then you can punch holes in there if you want. You're not going to have the airflow. Did you put so, uh, any type of air barrier on the backside of your drywall as you're putting it against the sill? Uh, the, yeah, there's a moisture. Yeah, there's a vapor barrier behind the drywall. Yeah, I mean, did you glue something up there or something to get the uh, make it perfect against the top plate? You uh, didn't no, care about that no, because, because there's a gap. Yeah. There's going to be a gap no matter what. It was spray foamed. Okay. We spray foamed all that. Appreciate and your idea with the can lights, by the way, a good alternative for can lights is the new LED replacements. And the new LED replacements have a great gasket, and they fit right in. And you, you, you take the LED. You might have to take a little bit of part in the inside. They cost about 15 bucks. The problem is your wife. That's the problem. The, the appearance. I have that problem in my house. Believe it or not, I gave in, and I have about 10 can lights in our kitchen. I didn't want to do it, but I gave in to it. So I tried one of those LED replacements, and they're good. They're great. you got to caulk and seal. Uh, you can take the old fixture, and you seal it up with caulk. If the new fixture fits in, it's got a big, wide gasket. But my wife doesn't like the way it looks. So that's why I say the problem is your wife. Yeah. Um, you can get the right color, 27K, 2700K, it's the right color, but it doesn't look the same. So I'm working on that one. Thank you. Yes, sir. Russ from Washington. I see this probably several times a week on houses I look at. You know, the half brick veneer walls, four feet tall or so, on the outside of the garage in the front of the home. Where it comes down and meets the driveway, there's never any flashing. Yeah. So we understand that they should have. You should see a, a flashing sticking out the bottom, above the driveway. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And the other area is they always run it down into the. the I looked at a brand new house a couple of days ago, just built. Run it down into the mulch. No weep holes. No flashing at the bottom. Shouldn't be that way. So you should always call out weep holes and flashing, right? Yeah. And the, truly, the brick veneer should be six inches above the soil, and you should be the foundation wall. Now it's never done that way. Oh, yeah. So I tell people, to yell at me. <laughs> yeah. So I tell people it's a potential problem, but I also tell them, dig that all out, put gravel all in there. It's a potential for a leak. The builders all do it that way. They all do it wrong. You know what are you going to do? Um, but I still identify it and try to explain the situation. Okay. Thank you. All right. So let me close up shop, and you guys, anyone's welcome to come up and answer me questions. My final closing is: um, we don't build them like we used to. We understand building science. We can be advocates for the consumer, but you've got to understand some of the building science behind it. You really need to think beyond just the problems that you see. And do you know the difference between ignorance and apathy? The difference is I don't know and I don't care. So home inspectors need to be in that ignorance category. I do it all the time. I'll just say, I don't know. If you don't have an answer, I don't know. But I do care and I'll see what I can do. Otherwise, you get into that... CYA, CYI, I think that's CYA. Call your attorney. <laughs> that's what that means. You've been a great group. Thank you very much.